So welcome back, everyone. This was a very inspiring talk by Linda Rising. Thank you, Linda, again. And we move quickly to our next speaker, which is Roman Pichler. I'm super excited to have Roman with us. Uh, he's one of the thought leaders in the product owner space. And um, I have been using the tools that Roman created, the product vision board, his persona template, the Go product roadmap. All of them are critical parts of my product owner training. So I couldn't be prouder than having him with us on the second Agile 100 conference. Roman, I, I think you don't need further introduction. I hand over to you. The stage is yours. We're super excited to hear from your insights. Well, thank you. Thank you for the kind words, uh, Saurabh. Let me just uh, try and share my screen with you. Cool. So uh, as you can see, I'd like to talk to you today about dealing with difficult stakeholders. So it's a talk that's primarily aimed at those amongst you who work as uh, product owners, uh, who have a product management job, but I hope that others will take uh, a little bit away from it as well, will benefit from it a little bit too. Now, um, when I meet somebody who I find difficult, then there's usually an element of uh, disagreement, friction, conflict. I might uh, disagree with the views and opinions of the person, or I might just find the individual not very likable. Now, um, conflict, so there's usually an element of conflict. And, and conflict really is something rather natural. Conflict happens when two or more people are in disagreement, experience a clash of interests. So it routinely happens at home and at work. Um, you know, when people engage with different perspectives. So you, you might say, okay, well, what's then the big deal in an agile setting? What's the big deal for product owners? Well, I, I, I find that product owners experience a fair amount of conflict. And part of, part of the reason is the role, the nature of the role. So product owners interact with different groups of people. And those groups have usually different viewpoints, perspectives, interests, and needs. The first group are the users and customers. And depending on the size of the market and the age of your product, that could be a rather large group. And it might also be a fairly diverse and heterogeneous group. So uh, users often don't have the same needs and interests as customers. So you, you may have some friction there. And then as a product owners, we interact with the business stakeholders. So for commercial product, those will be individuals from marketing, or sales, or support, service, maybe finance. And as they come from different departments and business units, they're likely to have different goals and different interests. So again, you know, there may be an element of, of friction there. And finally, we interact with one or more development teams. And these are usually cross-functional. So people have different uh, skills and often different perspectives and ideas. And again, you know, there's an element of diversity and, and you know, potential for having disagreements and experiencing some conflict. So I think that at least partly explains why we, uh, you, know, uh, you know, have the challenge of uh, dealing with uh, conflict and dealing with difficult people. Now, um, the unfortunate thing, at least for me, is that most of the conflicts I've experienced at work weren't handled particularly skillfully. Um, some were ignored and uh, or suppressed, and many never got resolved properly. And when that happens, then there's a trail of bad feelings and mistrust that's left behind, and connections are, are damaged. But on the positive side, if we learn to deal with conflict in a constructive manner, then it can become a source of innovation and creativity for our products. It can actually help us build and strengthen relationships with the stakeholders and development team members. And it can allow us to grow as an individual. Now, I thought to make this a little bit more specific, I'll share a story with you, a scenario, which is taken from my new book, How to Lead in Product Management. And the um, person or persona referred to as you in the story uh, is the product owner. So I'll uh, read it out to you. Listen, I really need you to add this feature to the release. And I'm not going to take no for an answer, says Sophie, the head of sales, as she stands in front of your desk. 
you can feel your shoulders tensing and your stomach tightening. There is no way that you can add more work to the development effort. The dev team is already struggling with the current workload. But Sophie is a powerful senior manager who will not be afraid to escalate the issue. What should you do? Now, you may have different reactions to this story and different ideas how to handle the situation. But generally, there are four common strategies to deal with disagreement and conflict, which unfortunately aren't very helpful, um, despite them being so, so common. And I, I took those from a book called uh, Say What You Mean by uh, Oren J. Sofer. And the first strategy is called competitive confrontation. Competitive confrontation applied to the story I just shared with you would be would mean engaging in an open conflict with Sophie. And uh, I might say to Sophie, uh, as you well know, the development team is maxed out. You know, we already have a committed release goal. We're halfway through the development efforts. How should we add this? There is no way, in fact, that we can take on more work and we can add an extra feature. And you know, you come here and you interrupt my work and you demand that we implement this feature. There's no way I'm gonna gonna take this. I'm not gonna have it. No way. I'm not gonna do it. No. <laughs> so I'll uh, I'll try and in a way bang heads with Sophie. And uh, I believe that I'm right and she's wrong. And most likely, you know, she's the one to blame. She initiated it. She came here. Why is she demanding this feature? And you know, being all pushy and funny. Um, and I'll try and put her in a place. And I believe that I need to fight for my needs and any warm heartedness, any kindness, any empathy I show will likely be used against me and interpreted as a sign of a weakness. So I really try and put her in a place, I'll push back on her and I try and win. So this is a strategy where I try and win and therefore, well, Sophie is gonna lose. The next strategy is still about winning, but in, but in this strategy, I don't engage directly, but more through indirect means. And it's called passive aggression. So I'm being, uh, um, so what, what um, you know, another way to look at this is to say I'm, I, I'd, I'd engage in some form of guerrilla tactics. So I'll, I'll try and be difficult to work with, and I may not commit to any uh, specific action. I may say to Sophie, oh, this is going to be really difficult. And I, honestly, it's, you know, I don't quite li like what I hear you uh, requesting here. And this is, uh, oh, I can't really promise you anything. And, um, you know, I can put it on the product backlog, but I'll have to go and talk to the development team first and then get back to you. This is going to be really hard. And, you know, you're really asking for some very special favors here. So, um, you know, that still comes from this, the strategy still is based on the assumption that um, I'm right and Sophie is wrong. But um, I don't really believe that now openly addressing the issue won't make any positive difference. And I believe, in fact, it could make things worse for me. But then, you know, I might go to the development team and say, guys, guess what? Sophie just came and she demanded that we implement this extra feature on top of everything else that we have to do. Hey, but don't worry. Don't worry. I'll put it right at the bottom of the product backlog, deprioritize it. We'll never get to it. And then maybe I'll go and talk badly behind Sophie's back about her to other product people. And, and you know, I might say something like, oh, did, did, has she done something similar to you as well? Oh, my God, you won't believe this. It's outrageous. And how can she? <laughs> and sort of try and label her that way. Um, so that would be uh, the second strategy. And again, you know, I've seen both strategies employed by product people. It, particularly the first one is a smart strategy to use. You know, given that with Sophie, we have here a senior stakeholder, I leave that up to you. But uh, as I said, you know, I've certainly seen both applied by product owners. Now, the third one, the third strategy is less about winning. Uh, it's more about uh, reducing our losses. Uh, it's called conflict avoidance. And applied to the scenario, um, you know, the strategy would mean saying, is this really such a big deal? Do we have to make a big drama out of this? I mean, come on, you know, at the end of the day, it's just a feature request, right? Sophie, she's a senior stakeholder. Usually she seems a reasonable person. And, you know, 
I'm sure she knows what she does and I'm sure there's a really good reason why she needs that feature. In fact, we can just go and find out and ask her. So let's have a can-do attitude. Let's be cooperative. Um, there's no way that we can implement this, uh, the whole feature now, but maybe we can split the difference, right? Maybe we can do par a part of it now and strike a deal, you know, agree on a compromise, you know, what would be wrong with that? And some of you may be saying, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, let, let, let's do that. That's, that's what I would do. That's what I would do. And I think on the surface, it, it does look good. But I think the issue with it is that it doesn't address the actual conflict. So the conflict for me, if I was the Scrum product owner and Sophie came to my desk and essentially demanded a feature, I, I, the, the first issue I would have is that, I'm, I'm, that I'd feel that Sophie's not paying respect to me and the role that I'm playing. I mean, I would expect that I'm an empowered Scrum product owner, somebody who's respected and somebody who's given the necessary authority to make even sometimes difficult product decisions in order to maximize the value the product creates. Now, Sophie coming to me and trying to push through that feature, demanding that feature, wanting that feature expedited, really means that she's looking at me as if I was, as if I was her personal assistant rather than, as I said, an empowered product owner. So, you know, that's, that's, that's part of the underlying, or that's the first underlying issue. The second underlying issue for me is that I'd expect that in any um, organization, there is an established way to look at uh, feature requests and regularly review the product strategy and the product roadmap and look at you know, generally the product performance and the KPIs and look at uh, trends and the competition, uh, look at the development progress and discuss any any ideas for future desired benefits and changes and new features. And I would hope that particularly in an agile setting that this is a collaborative workshop where stakeholders, key stakeholders are invited and development representatives also participate. And that hopefully some form of agreement is achieved about adjustments to the product strategy and to the product roadmap. So I'd expect that Sophie um, shows up and comes to those meetings and respects the established product management processes, where in fact, I'd expect that one of her team members acts as the sales rep and regularly attends those workshops, those meetings. And so by her coming to me and trying to push through that feature, she's not respecting the processes. And if I now agree on a compromise, then I indirectly approve her behavior and what stops her then from doing a similar thing in the future, behaving in similar ways again, and what stops other stakeholders from showing, you know, a similar behavior, copying what she's done, coming to me and demanding, requesting a feature. So I don't really think conflict avoidance would be helpful either, nor would be passivity, which means me saying, well, what should I do? I'm just, a little scrum product owner and there's Sophie, she's the big powerful stakeholder. Yes, I can try and say no, but if I say no, what, 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 what's, what's the point? Sophie is gonna go straight to my boss. He's, he or she's gonna come straight to me and say, Roman, you're gonna do it. And, and there you have it. I, I don't have a choice. I don't have a choice. But of course, by embracing this uh, strategy, it, it means that I'd give up my needs and I'd you know, again, let Sophie get away with what I would consider to be unhelpful and, and inappropriate behavior. And it's not only that I don't protect my own needs, it's, all, it's, it's also the development team that's on the line because if I just follow this passivity strategy, it would mean that I'd have to go to the development team and say, guys, can you please do this? I don't really mind how you do it, come in at the weekend, work extra hours uh, you know, every day, stay longer, which I don't think is healthy, which I don't think is appropriate. So none of those strategies uh, really is helpful. Well, if that's the case, then what could help us? How uh, could we influence Sophie and encourage her uh, to change her behavior in a, in a positive way and uh, understand that her request is unrealistic and maybe her behavior that she's showing not, not very helpful? Well, it turns out the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation in the United States, uh, experienced a, a similar but admittedly much more extreme challenge. So imagine that you are faced with the following situation. Armed terrorists have kidnapped a group of civilians and they are now asking for a ransom. They're threatening to kill the hostages if their demands are not fulfilled. 
if you grew up like me in the 1980s with Hollywood movies, you might say, well, what's the big deal? Send in a Rambo-like agent who can single-handedly free the hostages and capture the baddies, right? Turns out the FBI have tried this approach with a low success but a high death rate. So uh, what can we then do? Well, the FBI have developed a model and that's called the behavioral change stairway model. And that's what I'd like to uh, introduce to you now. So no matter if we're dealing with an armed terrorist or a difficult senior stakeholder like Sophie, what we'd like to achieve is a positive behavior change. So again, in the case of Sophie, that means to encourage her to understand that her request is unrealistic and her behavior isn't really helpful and ultimately follow our, 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 our advice and guidance. The trouble, of course, is that as a product owner, we're not in a position to tell Sophie what to do. We're not her boss, obviously. Uh, we, we usually don't, uh, aren't capable of offering some form of incentives like a bonus or a pay rise either. We lack what's referred to as transactional power. So how can we then encourage that behavior change? Well, the answer is by exercising a positive influence on her, by uh, trying, helping her become uh, aware and open to our perspectives and our needs and ultimately our advice and guidance so that hopefully she'll then follow, follow that guidance, follow our lead. That of course, you know, brings up the question, but how do we influence her again, given that we don't have any transactional power? And the answer in the FBI model is by building trust, by establishing rapport. Only if Sophie trusts us, will she be willing to truly listen to us and take on board what we have to say, which then hopefully will give rise and trigger that behavior change. So it's really all about trust. And I think Joseph talked earlier today about trust. And trust to me really means that uh, somebody feels safe in our presence, that somebody believes that we have good intentions and that acting on our advice will be beneficial. So if you trust a person, you, you feel safe in her or his preference and you're comfortable speaking your mind. So, you know, that's really what we'd like to establish. Now, a key technique to establish trust is to empathize with an individual, in this case, Sophie. So uh, not to uh, tell her what's wrong with her and her behavior and what she should do better, at least not initially, <laughs> but really taking a genuine warm-hearted interest in her. Now, um, Linda talked about the ability to relate to people no matter how difficult they are. And I, find, I, I thought that was really nice because it's a fundamental um, capacity that we have as human beings. Um, empathizing with somebody who we like and who we agree with is easy. Um, empathizing with somebody who we do not like, who we find difficult, or with whose opinion we strongly disagree is much more challenging. But still, it's possible to reach out with a person with a genuine interest and come from a place of curiosity and care and, and warm-heartedness, kindness, rather than uh, feel uh, aversion or even anger and um, you know, believe that I'm right and Sophie is wrong. So as long as I believe I'm right and she's wrong and it's her fault, it'll be very difficult to constructively address that conflict. In fact, I'd say it's going to be impossible. And empathy really ultimately means accepting what Sophie says and does. Now, again, I may disagree. I may disapprove. I, don't, I may not like what she says and what she does, but I, 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 I'm willing to let it be and accept it for now so I can work with it. So empathy, really trying to understand Sophie, trying to understand where she's coming from, her underlying needs, her emotions. And a great way to cultivate or strengthen uh, empathy and understand what's up with another person is to listen. So not to tell and say again, you know, this is all wrong with you. This is why you are wrong and this is why I'm right. Something I'm often tempted to do, but uh, instead really try and make an effort and uh, listen deeply. Now it's called behavioral change stairway model because these steps form a sequence. So you can't skip any of those steps. You first have to actively listen, listen deeply, make an effort to understand what's going on for the other person and build empathy. That then leads hopefully to trust, which allows you then to exercise a positive influence on the individual. 
and this will then hopefully result on uh, the desired positive behavior change. But of course, there is no guarantee that this will work. But given that we lack transactional power and we can't tell senior stakeholders what, what to do, what other choice do we have? So as active listening is the first and maybe the most important step in this model, I thought I'd share, share three tips, listening tips uh, with you. Um, and the first one uh, says, be fully present and listen uh, attentively. Now you may sound, you may think that that sounds pretty trivial. Yeah, just, just listen. But active listening is called active listening because when we really pay attention, when we're really present, when we really listen to understand, then uh, it can sometimes feel like a, a bit of work. You know, there's an effort that we have to make, uh, a coach's effort that we have to make. So the idea is to give our full and undivided attention to the other person. And that's particularly helpful when we're having uh, an important or difficult conversation. Why? Well, first of all, it makes the other person feel appreciated and valued and listened to. I think as human beings, we, we notice if somebody sort of pretends to listen or half is half listening or if somebody's truly listening and really taking it in what we have to say and is, is accepting and is open. Again, it doesn't mean that we approve. It doesn't mean that we agree, but, you know, really willing to, to listen and take everything in. And that then, um, that appreciation helps build trust. And secondly, by being attentive and leading with presence here in a difficult conversation, we maximize the chances that we actually, you know, receive all the information that Sophie is, is sharing and, you know, not sort of going off it already thinking about how to respond and how to convince her and, you know, formulating the, the right arguments and choosing the right words in our mind while uh, Sophie is still uh, speaking to us and in order to be able to uh, take advantage of uh, this technique uh, i would suggest that you don't feel rushed um, to start a difficult conversation so if sophie uh, comes to me um, and talks to me in the way i described earlier i will probably have a fairly strong emotional reaction uh, i might feel confused irritated there might be an element of frustration aversion anger there might even be an element of anxiety worrying about how this is all gonna work out and what the impact on me and my career progression might be depending on how i behave so there might be a lot of difficult feelings present and if i now immediately jump into trying to sort things out then i might not um, what i say and how i say it you know might actually be influenced by those difficult feelings and I might act them out and say things that I later regret. So in that case, you know, for me, certainly it would be best to recognize that well, actually I'm pretty worked up right now and I need some time just to let things think, sink in and let my emotions kind of subside a little bit, weaken a little bit. And so, you know, I would probably try and say to Sophie, you know, it's really important for me that we sort this out and find a solution that works for both of us but I'm feeling a little bit worked up right now. Can we please talk in an hour or tomorrow morning or in the afternoon or whatever works? Um, so again, just to buy myself a little bit of time to uh, reflect on what's happening. And then secondly, uh, try and schedule some time between uh, meetings, particularly meetings where there's a chance that uh, you, you, you may have or you might have a difficult conversation and avoid rushing from one meeting to the next that allows you to get ready and also then to digest a little bit of what you've just um, experienced and what you've heard, maybe what you've said. The second tip uh, encourages you to be respectfully curious, uh, suspend judgment and uh, cultivate an open mind. Now I find I can be so attached, I can be clinging so much to my preconceived ideas and thoughts that actually I'm not listening. I'm not fully listening to the other person. And I can find myself evaluating and judging what the person is saying while the person is still speaking. And what that can do is it can, uh, it can, it can mean that I act on biases. I think uh, Linda talked about being biased earlier. And it can mean that I miss important pieces of information. Sophie might be right. She might be right. Maybe that feature really should be implemented and maybe we should remove other features or pieces of functionality from the release. Maybe we should adjust the re release goal. Maybe we have to rework the roadmap. That might be a good reason. But if I'm set on the idea that Sophie is a difficult person anyway, so you know, I'm labeling her, 
and um that you know usually she just says stuff that isn't very helpful or whatever you know that request certainly can't be helpful you know if i'm sort of fixated on that and i believe you know that's what it is then i'm unlikely to be open to what she has to say and really look at it properly and so i might miss out on an important opportunity and i think generally cultivating an open mind is extremely helpful for product owners uh, as product owners ultimately we always have to learn and uh, learn from the stakeholders the development team members the users and customers in order to progress our product and uh, add more value um, and so a good way to cultivate an open mind and reach out to Sophie with a warm heartedness and listen to her in a, in a kind way is to think of the positive traits that Sophie has. Um, so, I, you know, no human being is, is, is purely difficult or, or bad. That's just me attaching a label to someone. You know, there must be something that Sophie's done uh, that's positive, that's good. Maybe she is really concerned about her team members, uh, her members of staff, or maybe there's something nice that she's done to me maybe a while, a while ago, even if it's just something little. If I can find that, then, you know, that allows me to soften my attitude towards her and be more open-minded. And even if that wasn't the case, the least thing I can try and do is be humble and grateful for her perspective, uh, even if I disagree or even if I regard it as inappropriate, uh, even if somebody shares an ill-conceived or wrong idea with us, we can still learn from some, something from it. And even if that's only how easy it is to fall prey to our own biases, right? And finally, uh, listen not only for facts, but go deeper and listen for feelings and needs. Um, so facts, of course, is what somebody says. It's essentially the data that is being communicated. Uh, feelings are the emotions that are present in the person. Uh, say Sophie comes to me and she's got a red face and she talks rather loudly and chances are she's upset. She's worked up. And that'd be then interesting uh, to explore and understand why is that. You know, the interesting thing is that emotions, I find it interesting at least, that emotions tend to be gateways towards needs. So if I know that Sophie is upset, then you know, it'd be natural to ask, why is she upset? And a good way to do this is open questions, questions that start with why, how, or what. So I might say to Sophie, oh, you know, you, you seem, it seems that this feature is really important to you. Can you please help me understand why that is? And to understand the reasons, her reasons for requesting that feature, and not only in terms of, yeah, because that's going to maximize the benefit of that specific release. No, 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 no what's in it for her what are her personal interests what's her personal interest what are her personal goals so that could be about her meeting some specific sales targets or her team meeting specific sales targets and being able to uh, receive a specific bonus whatever it might be so you know it's worth digging deeper because that ultimately then leads to finding a solution that is acceptable and sustainable and both parties can can live with So to uh, summarize, uh, dealing with difficult people is a part and parcel of being a product owner. It comes with the job, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> some of you might say. I mean, it's called product management, but I sometimes think it should be called people management. So much of what product people, product owners do is really about interacting with people, connecting people, sorting out people issues. And so I think it's important that we recognize this and that we don't kind of belittle relationship building and conflict resolution work and all that good stuff and say like, yeah, well, you know, I'll, I'll do it. You know, once I've done the real work, once I've reworked the product roadmap and I've reprioritized the product backlog and I've written those user stories and blah, blah, blah. But finding a healthy balance and really uh, looking at um, uh, co certainly conflict resolution and trust building as core part of our, our work and just to remind you, unresolved conflicts don't just go away. They linger, they stay around. And when they stay around, they affect relationships. You know, So if that conflict between me and Sophie isn't resolved, then I might feel I might hold a grudge against Sophie. And every time I, I speak to her, you know, there might be this, this, this grudge, this aversion. And you know, I might attach you know, an unkind label to her. Um, and possibly even to her team members. It can reduce my mental well-being, well, because of that aversion that is present, and certainly reduce productivity. It's hard to work well with somebody who you don't get on well with or where there's still unresolved conflict lingering somewhere in the background. 
Uh, on the positive side, uh, learning to resolve conflict is a key leadership skill um, that as product owners, we should actively uh, develop. Uh, why? It strengthens the connections with the stakeholders and development teams. It can help prove, improve the work environment and it can help us grow as individuals and leaders. It can help us learn more about ourselves. So I hope uh, you found what I had to share uh, helpful. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, you can find out more about my thoughts on product leadership uh, on my website. And I recently uh, published a new book uh, called How to Lead in Product Management that uh, offers more guidance on dealing with difficult stakeholders and uh, resolving conflict. And I'm very much looking forward to your questions uh, right now. But if for whatever reason I don't get to answer your question or you'd like to ask me a follow-up question, or whatever it might be, then don't be shy. Please uh, reach out to me via email. So thank you for your attention again. I'll Perfect. Stop sharing. Roman, yes, thank you so much. Uh, I found it certainly super insightful and uh, wrote a bunch of questions for myself. But uh, <clears throat> in order to be fair to our audience, I will start uh, with their questions first. So Victoria was the first person to ask a question and her question was about what do you recommend when the discussion becomes too emotional? So you covered that partly now, it becomes too emotional and people are unable to listen or stay nice. Are there any additional techniques that you would advise us to use? So yeah, it's a, uh, it's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, so a technique that I try and use is to pause, pause the conversation and take a break. So yes, you know, particularly when you're talking about difficult uh, challenging issues people are passionate about, where there's some some emotional attachment, um, then things can get heated. But I think rather than sort of trying to push through, often it's better to take a break, even if it's just a short break, like a tea or coffee break, a five minute break, 10 minute break, just to allow people to become aware of their mental state and let those emotions, those difficult emotions subside a little bit. So we're then able to to continue the conversation in a, in a maybe more effective way. And the, the other thing I'd like to say uh, very briefly is that um, I used to think it's bad to feel anger, jealousy, aversion, anxiety, frustration, irritation. I, I used to think I shouldn't be having those, those feelings. I shouldn't be having those emotions. That's wrong. But over the years, I've come to learn, at least for myself, that they are part of me. And I believe they're part of human nature. So I think it's, it's in a way natural to feel worked up it's it's natural to feel agitated it's natural to feel a aversion that's natural it happens to all of us the, the 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 trick is or the the key point is how do we how do we deal with it do we in a way just suppress it or act it out and then you know say something unkind to the other person and possibly shout at the individual or you know do we make an effort and try and develop a certain awareness and, and acceptance and and i find if I'm, if I'm, for instance, feel aversion and I become aware of it, then often that's the first step towards feeling less um, aver um, uh, less aversion, <laughs> feeling less uh, confrontational, and and yes. you know having kinder, starting to have kinder thoughts about the other person. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, having difficult emotions perfectly okay, but it's important to learn to to deal with them in a in a healthy, skillful way. Yeah. And, and I like the fact that you brought in yourself as a person, right? Because it's not only that the other person is like not nice or maybe it could also be you and be, being aware of that and taking a break, a timeout, maybe even it's just a mental timeout is super helpful. Another piece of advice that I think is um, helpful here is as a product owner, you're not alone. Mm -hmm. So you have the scrum master as a person who could get in there and facilitate that process with difficult stakeholders as well. So I would always encourage people to do that. Now, the second question comes from Oliver, and I think we clearly see Oliver and I have been working a lot with each other because that's exactly my question. You gave a lot of examples of dealing with one difficult stakeholder. Now, what happens if you're dealing with a group of stakeholders that, as you mentioned, are heterogeneous, right? They're not all the same. So what do you do there? I think ultimately it's about building meaningful connections and relationships with uh, those group members. So I think ultimately really it's about establishing trust and empathizing with the individual stakeholders. And that may take time. So one of the 
things that I started to recommend a while back and that I, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, write about in, in my new book is to try and uh, work with a former stable group of stakeholders. I think it's very tricky when stakeholders come and go. I think chances of building good relationships, good connections and, and trustful connections with stakeholders, it's much greater when we have a stable group. So we can get to know each other and mm -hmm. we can find out more about each other. And, you know, people may experience that our, our advice tends to be solid. And again, that, that creates trust um, and, and really the, trying then to build some form of stakeholder community um, where mm -hmm. ultimately or ideally the group of stakeholders moves away from, you know, demanding things and listing their demands to the product owner and trying to get them into the product backlog to trying to work towards shared outcomes, shared goals. Yeah. But that, that is a process and that takes time and it takes effort. And I, I fully understand that. And I, I fully understand that some product owners are in, in very difficult situations. Uh, I've been myself in, in very difficult work situations, uh, had very difficult bosses at times, at certain times of my career. Um, and, and, and then applying some of the techniques that I shared is certainly more challenging. I fully acknowledge that, but it, you know, I find it's still applicable. You can still apply those techniques. It's just a little bit more effort. It just takes a little bit more time. Yeah. And I think the point that you mentioned with aligning the group of stakeholders and then and that enough. I once read a quote, I can't get it right 100%, but it was more in this direction. If you get the people on your boat all rowing in the same direction, no matter how fast they row, you will still beat everyone else in the market because you're aligned. And in many organizations, we all know that stakeholders are not aligned. And I think it's important as a product owner to make that effort and you can start with the product vision, aligning everyone, following the same North Star, and then and that, and that effort pays off. Now, um, Petr mentioned, um, so you were talking a lot about business stakeholders. Your conversations with Sophie, right, were with a business stakeholder, and you presented the STAIR model. Would you apply that as well to the work that a product owner does with the development team? Yes, I would. I mean, ultimately, you know, it's about interacting with human beings. And so stakeholders, you know, may have, they may have a different level of seniority. They may have a different standing in the organization. They may have different concerns and perspectives and needs, but ultimately, you know, they're human beings, just like, of course, the, the development team members. So I think for, for a product owner, a key success factor and a key challenge is to build those trustful connections with the key stakeholders and with the development team members. Mm -hmm. um, because those trustful connections then allow us to work together more effectively. They'll make it much easier to reach agreements and make it much more likely that people support shared goals, shared outcomes, you know, around strategic goals, um, as well as tactical ones. And that, you know, the alignment that you mentioned earlier actually, you know, manifests itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Now, um, Robert wants to know, how do you manage constant changes requests from an executive? And I think he's going in the direction that people that try to overrule a product owner's decision, right? Some people in the organization might believe they have the authority to do it. And not every organization lives the product owner role in the way that we would love it or like, like to see it. So how would you deal with that? Yeah, nice question. So uh, again, thank you for asking, asking asking it um, when you have an executive who uh, tries to overrule or overrules the product owner's decisions then the executive doesn't in a way respect the role of the product owner be it in general or doesn't respect and trust the individual and so it'd be for me then interesting to find out what is going on here is it really around product management i would call it product management maturity is it due to the fact that maybe product management isn't very um isn't effective hasn't been isn't effectively established in the organization maybe you know it's fairly new to the organization and maybe the executive isn't fully aware of the, the job of a product owner maybe hasn't worked with product owners before doesn't really understand the empowerment and respect if product owners need in order to do an effective job um so what what's going on there is it more personal issue does the individual does the individual is there an element of mistrust you know that's really related to me as a person 
And a good way to find out would be to try and engage in a conversation and practice active listening and empathy, even though I might have feel some aversion towards the individual, might, might feel the, the individual, might consider the individual being difficult. Um, but try and engage with an open mind and, and hear what's going on. You know, why is that happening? You know, what's the reason? And once you know the reason, then I think you're in a much better position to um, uh, apply the right course of action. And with, with organizational issues and in a way product management maturity and establishing the product owner role successfully in the organization, I'd like to go back, sort of to what you said earlier. You know, that's really something where I feel a scrum master should come in and really where a scrum master should then support the, the product owners. I wouldn't expect the product owner does that job or does that job on her or so, you know, all by, by her or himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And I think you, you mentioned an important point. One is listening to those stakeholders actively, understanding their perspectives, which then you can include in your prioritization decisions. Another mm -hmm. thing which I think is important is if you decide to prioritize in a different way than that executive would like, once you've listened closely, you can actually make a much better argument for your case because that person sees that you have reflected on their perspectives and maybe they can then follow your storyline better. Mm. Plus, we're all humans. You mentioned this with regards to the development team. I think people, if they see we're listening, they just feel taken care of. And that makes a lot of the conversations also easier. So thanks for that advice. Now, let me see, what else do we have? We have um, York. York is asking, what do you do when you do not get the time? Yeah, nice question. Thanks for, for asking it. I think that's one of, uh, that's another key challenge product people face. We always seem to be short of time, constantly, permanently. Again, I think it's partly due to the nature uh, of our job. It's a very multifaceted job. There's so many different duties uh, and tasks that we have to take care of. You know, I would expect a Scrum product owner to engage in product discovery and look after the product strategy and the roadmap, but also work with the development team, but also at least on a quarterly basis, meet selected users and customers, uh, measure the product performance, work with KPIs. You know, the list goes on and on and on. And one of the techniques I found helpful in order to bring more awareness to the work of product owners in general and to my own work as well is to use the Eisenhower matrix, which encourages us to uh, classify or categorize our work in four, uh, along the uh, two, two dimensions. Um, how important is it and how urgent is it? Now, I find reflecting on my own work, but also talking to other product people and see how they uh, structure their days and the priorities that they set for themselves, that often it's the urgent work that we optimize our work for. And, and often really it's urgent work that isn't necessarily that super important. And I think there's a real danger that we forget the um, important but less urgent work. And that's typically around strategy, product discovery, but also relationship building in those the kind of leadership work that we have to do to guide and align the stakeholders and the development teams. Now, I, I fully understand we're all busy people, but if we don't block time in our calendar and learn to say no to maybe some not quite so important tasks or delegate some of that work, then and we don't attend enough to the important but maybe not quite so urgent tasks, then the, then mm. they'll 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 kind of that'll come back. And it'll, it'll create more work for us typically in the future. So you may not have paid close attention to um, the market and the competitors because you've been so busy working with the development team and you know, creating new user stories or whatever it might be. And now suddenly a competitor's leap leapfrog you and you've got a, a crisis situation at your hands and now you're, you're desperate to catch up. Now that could have been avoided if you know you would have managed to block that time in your calendar. And my suggestion is at least half a day per week some people like to do it, you know, or block, like literally, I don't know, block out, say Wednesday morning, Friday morning, um, and do uh, at least half a day of product discovery and strategy work. Some people like to do a little bit every single day. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's really what I would encourage you. And I know it sounds a little bit crazy. I'm busy and now Roman's telling me to take on more work, but you take on more work by focusing more on what is truly important and try and delegate some of the other work. So just to quickly finish this uh, train of thought, um, a great way how you can delegate work and empower people is by 
trying to mentor and educate the development team so that the development team members are in a position that they can take ownership of the solution and I'd maybe add full ownership of the solution, the product details, the UX design, the architecture and technology decisions, the Q&A, the documentation, all those good things. And that maybe you don't have to detail user stories to the nth degree and oops, I've just done something here, sorry press the wrong button because I'm getting excited. <laughs> <laughs> You're still on. You're still on. <laughs> Good. Um, but maybe the development team can work with larger user stories. Or maybe the development team becomes comfortable over time to do some of the refinement work on their own. I'm not saying you shouldn't look at the product backlog at all. But you know, I've, I've met a lot of product owners who feel their job is primarily to feed the development teams with very, very specced out, very fine grained detailed user stories. And it's like, how come we we think that? I mean, it doesn't doesn't state it anywhere in the Scrum Guide. It's like we just think we should do that. But is that really a smart use of our time? It's okay to, when you work with a new team. It's okay to get started. But over time, you're better off than again trying to empower the team, delegate work to the team, and maybe focus more on product discovery and strategy work. Yeah. No, I really like the the last things that you mentioned here. A lot of product owners do literally spoon feed the team with user stories detailed to the nth degree. But um, so what I use in my training is a maturity model that I took from um, Bill Joyner's leadership agility model. I say every product owner starts out as an expert, right? Doing all of the things that you just described, moves on to an achiever, like more, more about setting goals, et cetera, by delegating more and more authority to the team and ends out as a catalyst, which means providing context and clarity so that the development team can provide or take better decisions themselves. And I think from my experience, this is the only way also to scale from a one team scrum to multiple teams working on the same coherent, coherent message and ultimately a coherent product. Mm -hmm. So this is great. Now, let me see, what else do we have here? Um, Pavel, uh, so he was saying, let's say Sophie was right. How to manage to implement that feature within running release? How to avoid that we forget on such, um, uh, such an important thing? Yeah, nice question. Thank you for asking it. So when you find halfway through a m major development effort that may result in a major release, so um, a, a new version of your product that makes a noticeable difference to the users, that's how I define a major release. So maybe a development effort of two, three, maybe even six months. Um, then usually what's required in my experience is that you uh, consider adjusting the desired outcome that you'd like to achieve with this release, um, the desired benefits, the overarching release goal. And that could be, for instance, to uh, increase engagement uh, and conversion, for instance, or it could be around uh, removing technical debt to future-proof the product or to acquire more users by offering new features, for instance, whatever it might be. So, you know, first of all, the first kind of messages it's good to have a goal for each major release so it's good mm -hmm. to work benefits or desired outcomes for the next two to three months and then when you change course or you adjust uh, development efforts you know consider if the desired outcome goal benefit is still valid if not adjust it and that's something i would do uh, or suggest you consider doing together with the key stakeholders and development team representatives so mm -hmm. i think you know part of the um conflict avoidance strategy, part, part of the, the issues uh, that I, I shared is that, you know, if I now st strike a deal with Sophie, then what about the other stakeholders? What about the buy-in and support from the development yeah. team? So, I, you know, I then have really a, a road mapping a strategy workshop and, you know, schedule it as soon as you can, but make it collaborative, bring the right people together, discuss the feature, discuss why it is necessary to implement that feature or parts of that feature, assess the impact and make the necessary adjustments, but try and make them together so there is a shared understanding, you leverage people's creativity and knowledge and expertise, and you maximize the chances that they buy into those changes, that they'll support them and see them through. Yeah. Again, a topic of alignment, which is one of the key things that I think that a product owner does. Roman, thank you so much. There's still some questions in there, but we're running out of our time box. It was a pleasure having you here. I hope you stick around a bit. Maybe you can answer some of the questions in the chat. Now, for everyone else, we are taking a 40 minute break till six o'clock my time, which is in Cologne, Germany, basically at the top of the hour. Don't forget the coaches clinic is there to support you with all the questions that you have. And I'm sure there are people that can talk to you about product strategy as well. Thank you so much. See you in 40 minutes. Thanks again, Roman.
Thanks for having me.